Hi you all, I'm happy to be here among you and see all these faces. How do you feel? Uh, hungry before the lunch? Uh, to be honest, I feel nervous. I feel nervous because I assume you all came here to get a high quality talk about <laughs> how to make a quality of data great. And what I got for you is just bad news. Uh, no, you can't fix quality of data. It's just not possible. And the question is, does this even matter um, in the era of Gen AI? And I think it matters more than ever. Because all the companies have access to this new technology. But the, and the only differentiator which we can affect is what we feed into this new technology, what the data we feed into the models, and how good these data are. So let's get started. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, so let's get started. Uh, my name is Martina Ivanichova. I lead the data engineering uh, tribe at Kiwi.com. Uh, Kiwi.com uh, is a as an e-commerce travel company, we help customers from uh, travelers from all around the globe to find cheap flights. And I have been with Kiwi for something more than three years. And when I joined Kiwi as a data platform team lead, my like one of the very first things which I did was that I was interested in understanding uh, what are the main challenges our data users, data consumers within the company face. And by data users, I mean data analysts, data scientists, product managers, UX designers, anybody who needs data to do some important decision which affect customers, users, business. So we distributed a survey. And surprisingly, guess what was the outcome of the survey? The most prevalent answer was that the biggest issue is uh, data quality. So what we did, guess what happens if you task a team of data engineers to fix data quality? They will come up with all the great ideas like, we need to uh, set up data quality checks. We need to have a tooling, a right tooling in place which is able to execute these data quality checks. And we uh, also need to have like data cleansing pipeline, which remove duplicates and uh, impute missing values. And um, also like that data quality tooling, which we have should be robust enough to test for all the standard dimensions of data quality, such as timeliness, freshness, accuracy, consistency, and so on. So we did all of this. And the situation was even worse. Why so? Because now, after a couple of months, we had unhappy data consumers because the situation did not change significantly and unhappy data engineers because they had tens of pipelines to maintain. They had many, many alarms. Uh, notifications on Slack about fake pipelines and bad and failed data quality checks. So, um, I have been talking about uh, data quality for something like five or seven minutes, without even uh, getting to the point or to get into the question what data quality is. And I um, had some like informal conversation maybe over the coffee in the kitchen. I remember I had a discussion with a pricing uh, business analyst and I asked him like, okay, you complain about data quality. What exactly do you mean by that? And he told me, yeah, of course, Martina, I will explain this to you. So we have this risk-based product and in order to price it properly, uh, we need to um, understand on a per transaction level what are the exact uh, costs associated with each transaction, each order. And today we have this data, but they are at the time of the purchase. So they are just like expected costs. 
projected cost. And uh, since um, this is a risk-based product, some of the costs are incurred only later. So we are missing this information. This, and this is preventing us from like, having this proper pricing strategy. And I was like, well, I understand this is bad, but how does this relate to data quality? We either don't log the data, we don't calculate the data, data is just not there. How can I complain about data quality? It's the same as if I went to a grocery store, I wanted to buy bananas, and they had just apples. Would I complain about that product quality of that grocery store? Of course not. So I thought my, to myself, it, this is a just an like, isolated case. Until I talked to another colleague, um, the product manager responsible for uh, third-party ancillary products. So uh, as I said, we are selling flight tickets, but um, in, um, in some point of the user journey, our users might decide to not only book flights, but also to book accommodation. So they decide to uh, click on our offer where, where, we, where we redirect them uh, to a third party uh, partner site where they can also book the accommodation. And the thing was, uh, this product manager responsible for these ancillary products complained to me that Martina, look, uh, data quality is bad because in 30% of cases, we don't know what was the exact touch point when our customer decided to leave to that partner website. And I was like, okay, this is bad, but like, let's go and fix it. <laughs> let's, let's go to uh, web developers and uh, ask them to find a bug where this parameter in a redirect URL is not passed along and yeah, let's get things done. So the lesson learned here is that um, when the expectations, whenever the expectations of data consumers differ from reality, it is manifested as issues with uh, data quality. And what is the very worst thing about this is that these expectations are very often implicit, not manifested, not contracted, not promised. For example, I saw this many times, like I saw like data, let's say data analysts going directly to the source database, finding a table named booking orders, finding a column called amount, and assuming that this column is the total amount in euros with two uh, figure decimal precision representing the amount of that order. And this is totally implicit expectation, and the owner of that table, the, the software engineer who put in place the model is not even aware of this assumption. Well, so we understood that this is a complex topic, and as such, it has to be tackled from the multiple uh, point, of, point of view. So, um, when we want to address the data quality, we need to have in place right technology, and I call it here hard measures. But equally important are also so-called soft measures. And soft measures are hardest to implement. So by soft measures, I mean cultural measures, like bringing, bringing awareness, bringing culture. I will talk about this in a minute. So, what do I mean about, what do I precisely mean about technology measures? So first of all, they are data quality checks. And as I mentioned in the beginning, that was obviously the, one of the very first things which we did. By that time, there was no great expectations package as it was mentioned in a previous talk. We actually built our own in-house tooling, very similar to great expectations. Then we abandoned it and got something from the market, quite happy with that. And then there is something which we piloted, uh, which we call data integration test. There is a significant difference between these two because data quality checks are ex post measure. They might help you to understand 
that data are broken and you can't be fast enough to react before they reach your business. But it does not change the fact that the data are already bad. Um, unlike that, data integration tests are trying to prevent this, uh, not in the runtime, but already in the development time. Um, let me continue now with soft measures and let me then uh, later on elaborate on integration tests. Bear with me. As for the soft measures, we introduced a so-called, or tried to introduce, at least with some of the teams, uh, who had the biggest pain, a uh, data collaboration process. What does it mean? It means that um, there are multiple parties involved in every like new initiative or product feature. Uh, product managers, their job is to think like how we will measure success of the new feature which we are going to implement and how can data help us to understand uh, that result and how can we use data to improve the product for our users. Data analysts or analytics engineers are here to uh, suggest and help product managers to understand what can be done, what insights we can get, and to prepare the aggregated models, clean data which can be later used. And software engineers which possess a specific domain knowledge, they're responsible for keeping the data contract that promised that the data will be there in such a shape. And whenever we are doing a new development and we need to start logging new data, they will make sure this will happen. And just in a previous talk in this room, I'm not sure how many of you were here, uh, there was one sentence that said by a previous speaker no, that we can't trust what is on the input. And this is exactly what we are trying to fix here, uh, trying to make sure that there is someone guaranteeing how the source data look like. And then another sub-pillar of soft measures is product thinking. Not all of us drive Teslas. Not all the data matter the same. And there is a significant cost associated in maintaining uh, good data. And let me explain this again on that exam example with ancillary products. Um, when that product manager complained about 30% cases where this information is missing, my answer should be, so what? Why does it matter? Does it matter because it shows bad on some of your dashboards? Then let's drop the dashboard. Or does it matter bec that it, because we need this data to craft our merchandising strategy? Then let's get fix it today. And all this will not happen without the ownership. So none of these issues, none of these tools and approaches can happen without having someone who is accountable. Who is accountable for that data, for who is waking up uh, in the night when the SLOs are not met, when the data quality checks trigger fail and trigger monitors, and without really the ownership. And now the question is who should own the data? I truly believe that uh, data ownership should be as close to the source as possible. Because only those who can impact the data can uh, really hold the full responsibility. You can have whatever cleaning pipelines, data tests, if data are not there, if data are missing are of bad quality, you will, as a data analyst, not fix it. Um, well, so let me, as I promised, come back to the integration test. Uh, we, run on a GC, we run on a GCP stack, and uh, that's why uh, I will be maybe a bit more uh, technology specific. Um, our interface between operational plane and analytical plane um, is the pub sub topic where uh, the events representing some business true which happened in the production are published. 
And with this topic, there is associated a schema, the protobuf proto uh, schema, uh, typically. And from there, the data are either you know, stored to the warehouse, like to big query tables, either they are used for maybe some streaming analytics, like to some uh, nearly real-time observation of the revenue, and then they are stored maybe, let's say, now in some GCS buckets and later used for feature, calculiza feature calculation and for ML models training. So this is an interface between the operational world and the analytical world. So, uh, so this order processing application, besides doing the order fulfillment uh, with each order, publishes this order event to this PubSub topic. Each time uh, we deploy a new version of that code, uh, we, before that, have run a CICD integration test, which tests if the event is not, we are not testing only whether it matches schema, but if, what we are trying to test the content of that data, whether we are putting some business assumptions there. So whenever there is a developer who creates a merge request and the integration tests are executed and these integration tests fail, which means that the integration test needs to be adjusted, this is a, this is an indication that uh, probably the data contract is going to be broken and the data consumers, downstream consumers, need to be aware of that, even maybe eventually approve and review the merge request. Uh, maybe a quick example, you can maybe check it, uh, check the code, can we give it a few seconds? So really, this is a simple, simple example, but uh, like I tried to demonstrate here that we are really uh, also trying to not to test only that the um, data comply to schema, but also that there are some business assumptions are turned from implicit to explicit. So in this case, you see that we expect amount to be a sum of base fare and service fee. And for example, whenever someone adds a new type of fee, like payment fee, uh, it, it either, uh, you know, it has to reflect the reality. So amount has to be bigger or there has to be a new field introduced, like to total amount including payment fee. Well, so with uh, all this being said, The, this still holds true. No, we really cannot fix data. But what you can do is that you can make sure that your most crucial data are protected as best as you can by integration test, that you will know uh, soon enough uh, that the production data are either missing or not matching the business assumption, and you can maybe act soon enough before they reach your um, business. And third, you can make sure that at least for crucial initiatives, uh, before you even start implementing, you know how you will evaluate your success and what new data you need to start logging to understand if this was a success or not. Uh, this is all from my side, but if you are interested in more tech content from Kiwi, check out our page. We have also a booth here. We have also some open roles. So feel free to uh, come if you pass by. And uh, also we can talk now or you can reach to me on LinkedIn. That's all from my side. Thank you very much for your talk. And now we have some time for questions. So if anybody has a question, they can come here, where I'm standing right now, and ask their questions. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks for a great talk. Um, you mentioned initially you implemented all the pipelines and alerts, and then the data quality were maybe not fixed. But then you still run these uh, data quality pipelines, right? Yeah, the, these, okay. Um, I didn't want to go into deep details in the presentation, but 
uh, these pipelines, we, yeah, we have many of these pipelines. They are not only for data quality, but also for data modeling. So we really um, you know, adopted Kimball methodology. We are organizing data uh, in the consumable way for end users. So yes, we still have this pipeline and pipelines, and they are checking the assumptions on the source data, but as well, they are modeling data in the consumable way. Yeah, uh, okay, um, so the question was, um, how um, say how much how big portion of problems you would be able to or you are able to capture by the integration test compared to the let's say more traditional quality um, pipelines? I I would not. Uh, these are complementary things. So you know, yeah, I think you will you always need both. But uh, and I, I, we have it on one project, so it is really hard to you know measure it. I know that we need KPIs. Uh, it's hard to give answer how much. But uh, as a general rule of thumb, as closer to the source as as earlier you discovered, the lower is your data downtime. So, and this is a crucial point. So it's not like how many you discover by which, but how soon you discover. Okay. Or that, we, that it will not happen even, you know. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Hello, uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I have a question you mentioned about uh, how you need to protect your most important data points <laughs> and that's basically the only thing you can really focus on and do. It's like, uh, who determines those most important data points? Because I believe that each product manager is going to say, mm -hmm. yeah, my data is most important. Mm -hmm. So what we did is that we categorized data into three tiers uh, based on the following criteria. First of all, is this data uh, important for OKRs, like uh, object, co object, company objectives and key result? Like, is it coming into the strategic decision? Then second, are these data coming to financial reporting and financial statement, which has to be really, really, you know, solid? And third, uh, do, does this data source, the, the, this data set, uh, really many, many downstream dependencies? So out of these three questions, if two are yes, we categorize it as tier one. Uh, as tier two, we categorize those which have like uh, one, uh, yes, and the rest is the tier three. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I agree that we need to improve data quality from the source, but how do you secure buy-in from stakeholders? As an analytics engineer or data analyst, you can gather halfway accurate data from multiple sources in data warehouse, but you know that you know the best data should come from this team but that team has to deliver you know, objectives for the quarter, and do not have time to do refactoring and collecting more data. So how do you secure a buy-in from your stakeholders? This is a very, very good question, and this is the hardest part. And it took us, let's say, two and a half years to go team by team, pursue them, explain them, demonstrate the data quality issues in production which happened, demonstrate what happened because we as our data analysts were not aware of these, you know, changes and then the reporting was wrong, you know, maybe some assumption in when building ML models was wrong. So we did go one by one, face-to-face -face conversation, explaining how bad it is and that this can help. And I'm not like claiming that we fix it everywhere, but I'm very happy seeing now a Slack conversation where software engineers from this team or this team come and say, hey, we are implementing these new features. How should we track it? Would you prefer to capture it in this attribute or in that attribute? So uh, yeah, it takes time. But it brings a value. But it brings value where it is most manifested, where the issues are biggest, because there you can get the buy earliest. Nice. Uh, thank you for taking questions. We actually have some more time for questions. If anybody has one. Um, otherwise, just thank you so much for your talk. It was really good. I think we all learned a lot. And uh, please, another round of applause. <laughs>